We have an interesting case here of visceral artery aneurysm embolization. Next slide. This is a 41-year-old female with intermittent abdominal discomfort with eating, and she also has a history of lymphoma. And on her screening uh, surveillance CT, a visceral artery aneurysm was found. Uh, her past surgical history is as listed there. Next slide. So on pre-procedure imaging, you can see this three centimeter saccular aneurysm, uh, which is at a trifurcation of a common origin of the celiac and SMA. And um, you can see on the, the axial and sagittal images there, we have the three centimeter aneurysm. Next slide. So teasing out the outflow here, there's three vessels, the common hepatic, the splenic, and the SMA, uh, as pictured there on the MIP image. And this here is a 3D reconstruction, which gives you an idea of those three uh, outflow vessels. Thank you. So uh, as in the previous case, we uh, accessed the left radial artery. Uh, we have a six French slender sheath in, which is our preferred sheath of choice when we're doing complex visceral or renal interventions. This is a, a seroradial catheter, uh, which was used to selectively catheterize the, the common celiac or mesenteric trunk. And what's, what's very nice here is it obviously matches up to the CT angiogram almost perfectly. And as you're seeing, the, the aneurysm is, is centered here. At approximately 12 o'clock, the splenic artery is taking off. At approximately 9 o'clock, the hepatic artery is taking off. And at about 5 o'clock, the superior mesenteric artery is taking off. Um, and again, I, I think you'll see as the, the uh, angiogram cycles through, the inferior pancreatical duodenal artery is uh, patent. Uh, off the uh, proximal right-handed side of the superior mesenteric artery, and you can almost visualize the anastomosis to the gastroduodenal artery. So that's what we're really trying to um, preserve here. Next angiogram, please. Here we uh, were able to exchange out the five French diagnostic catheter over a uh, floppy exchange length wire for a six French guiding catheter. And I can show you the guide catheter that we've, uh, that we've chosen here. So I'm not sure this is the exact same catheter, but this is a, this is a very similar shape here, if you can zoom in on that. So this is a, uh, a, a JR4 catheter, and uh, it's approximately 110 centimeters in uh, length. Uh, this guide system is manufactured by uh, Boston Scientific. They've been tremendous partners with us in developing a whole assortment of radial guide systems uh, to allow us to do these complex cases. Next angiogram, please. So here we've got the JR4 in the celiac aneurysm. And again, you see the, the anatomy laid out exactly according to the uh, CT scan. And then next angiogram, please. And then we, what we have now, which is where we are currently in the procedure, is we have a microcatheter coaxially through the guide uh, into the proximal splenic artery. So I, I know there's a lot going on here, but I'm happy to, again, take any questions or comments. I think what we're going to start to do now is deploy detachable coils in the proximal splenic artery to again uh, perform uh, what I would call a endovascular ligation of the proximal splenic artery. So I think what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start coring the uh, splenic artery. And what we've, what we've chosen here is a uh, uh, 018 uh, detachable coil. Uh, what we did was uh, before we got started with the case, we were able to measure the splenic artery, and it measured about a eight or nine millimeters in diameter. Uh, and what we typically will do is we'll be fairly aggressive with oversizing these coils, especially when we want them to, to really seat in. Uh, and uh, I think anybody who does embolization will you know, tell you with a, a high degree of certainty the most important coils are the first coil and the, and the last coil. So we really want to make sure that this thing doesn't fly out. We want to make sure it, it, it stays still. And uh, what we're trying to do now, and again, what the amazing thing about this technology is, is that if we don't like the way it's sitting, we can reposition it uh, and uh, you know, play with it, for lack of a better word, to try and get it to stay still. Very frequently with these, uh, with these coils, it takes you know, half a dozen or so deployments to get it to sit in the right location. And so I think Nora's just trying to get it to, to, to seat in one place. 
I think if we get a couple of loops out, we'll probably know whether it's going to sit still or not. Typically what happens here is right at that turning point, it'll double over and hopefully lock in. And that this may very well be exactly where we're going to sit with this coil mass here. That looks like a good size, Rob. Yeah, I, I, I think that you know what typically happens is that that distal tail goes on until you can really get it to you know stabilize. Yeah, and then, and then now it's it's out. So we're going to take our, our our next coil now. So Rob, we're going to go back to you if you if you can hear me. Sure. So uh, as you can hopefully see on the monitor, we've been making a decent amount of progress uh, taking down this splenic artery here. Um, everything's been going fairly well. You can see the initial coil had that tail that was projecting out. But beyond the tail, we've been able to condense the coil max very, very proximally. I'd say we're probably a total of you know, 20 or 30 millimeters beyond the ostium of the splenic artery off the uh, celiac aneurysm here. Um, and uh, everything's going very, very smoothly. Eventually, as, as you might imagine, the coil mass will just basically kick us back into the celiac artery. Uh, and then what we're probably going to do is, is just uh, shift over. Um, so, um, you know, everything's going pretty well. You can see the coil mass is already starting to prolapse down a little bit. So here we had backed ourselves out of the splenic artery. And by luck, the microcatheter uh, flipped over in the hepatic. And I think you get a very idea that we're very, very proximal to the hepatic. I think Peter had alluded to the fact we really wanted it to preserve the gastroduodenal artery. And so here we were, we were really happy with the positioning of the, of, the, of the coils here. And as we tried to lay down more coils in the stump of the common hepatic, we were getting pushed out. So can you forward to the next angiogram, please? So here you can see we, we've, been, we've been pushed out. The aneurysm is still open. And we have our guiding system in the origin of the celiac mesenteric trunk. We then have a uh, uh, O3-5 wire down the SMA. And we're basically getting ready, ready to deploy the stent across the neck there that you see of the celiac uh, aneurysm. Next angiogram, please. This is a cover stent. And again, it's, there, there's, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you can't take a look at this enough times to try and be sure that we're exactly perfectly centered on the neck of the aneurysm. Next run, please. Here on the bottom right of the screen, we left the stabilizer wire in, which is our preferred support wire when we're doing visceral stenting and renal stenting in to make sure that the guide wasn't just floating in the aorta. Um, and I, it's, I think it's a very important technical note here for this kind of a case when you're doing a stent assist that you really want to make sure that this, the stent is completely stable, the guide is completely stable, and as you can see, the, 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 the second system, the microcatheter, there's a tremendous amount of tension into it, and if we didn't have that stabilizer in the distal SMA, we likely would have just prolapsed the, the microcatheter into the aorta and lost access and had to restart it again. As you can see here, what we've done is we've gotten the microcatheter through the interstices of the stent. It's sitting in the celiac artery. Next run, please. And we've, we've put in a handful of coils already into the celiac artery. We're starting to get a really, really nice nest here. We're going to put in another one of the uh, interlock coils. And then I think we're going to shift over to a different device just so we can show that live. And so if you could show my hands, I'm, I'm loading in this, uh, this coil. This is the interlock system from Boston Scientific, which is really a, a, a great coil. I think, again, all these detachable coils are fantastic technology. And then uh, Nora is going to introduce the coil into the aneurysm. Uh, this is a very, very large coil. I think it's t at least 20 millimeters in diameter, probably 50 centimeters in length. And you can see it's just going to fill up a tremendous amount of space here. Um, and uh, you know, this is where we just need to be very patient, make sure we're delivering a tremendous amount of coils here. This is probably going to take another 15 or 20 coils to really make sure that we've uh, stopped all the flow in the aneurysm. But I figured this was a good time for us to go back live. Uh, and, uh, you know, sort of talk through some of the subtleties of this case. Obviously, very unique case, uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to overcome some of the anatomic challenges, but I think it raises a lot of technical points, uh, not only about uh, stent-assisted coiling, but detachable coils, 
which I think we really couldn't have done this proximal and embolization in these branches without them. Uh, and just the, the, the benefits of stent assist, as you can see here, it's going to be impossible for this coil mass to prolapse into the uh, superior mesenteric artery. So we've really got a very, very safe system here. So, so what Rob we're going to do now is we're introducing a, a product that's being distributed by uh, Medtronic now, formerly Covidian. And this is the concerto coil. And slightly different detachable technology. There's a proprietary handle, which we're going to get as, uh, um, as Nora's uh, putting in the, uh, the coil into the aneurysm sac. So let me just show this de detachment system. If you can zoom in on my, 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 my hands here. So there's a proprietary handle here. And then I'll answer all, the, all your questions. Here's the back end of the coil. We're basically going to just load this into the handle. And once it's locked in, I'm going to retract the handle very straightforward here. And then what that allows us to do is essentially just to retract the, the wire. And it should allow the coil to come back. And there you go. So the coil stayed in. So again, different technology. Uh, the, you know, the, 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 the handle makes it more of a mechanical de detachment. It's not just when the, the, the coil exits the tip of the microcatheter. We can put in a, another one of those while I'm answering all the, uh, all the uh, uh, questions here. But again, these are really fantastically safe products that I think allow these kind of complex embolizations to be done uh, with a level of safety we didn't have as recently as five years ago. So Mary, essentially making a hairpin turn and simultaneously trying to work up towards the head to engage the celiac artery and, and all the different branches. So uh, if I had to speculate, if we were to attempt to do this femoral, we probably would have lost access several times where the SMA wire would have, would have, would have, would have prolapsed. I think it would have been a much more challenging case from a technical point of view. Because we have a very, very stable guide system here in, from uh, above, I, as, as you can see, you know, the, the, the wire in the SMA is very stable. There's not a lot of tension in the system. I think you can see when we're introducing the coils, there's no movement in the guide. So I, again, I, I think for, for you know, this case, I think for almost all visceral aneurysms, it, it, the, the, the uh, radial approach or this you know, so-called antegrade approach just, just makes it much more easy to create a guiding system that's much more stable to the inventory to allow us to engage any, uh, any size or any angulation that the visceral already might, might come off. And then I think as we move more uh, caudal towards the iliac arteries, the femoral arteries, or even the, the, the superficial or popliteal arteries, again, we're going we're to need very, very long systems with a lot of stability to them to allow us to gain that much pushability and you know, cross more complex peripheral lesions. If this patient were to have any evidence of, a, of an endo leak, I think the next step would be to place a covered stent across the neck of this aneurysm. And again, I think I, I mentioned this earlier. My, my concern with that, as you, as you can see here, as, as accurate as we're trying to be, I think there's probably a, a good two or three millimeter fudge factor in terms of placing a stent here. I was really concerned that if we cover the inferior pancreatic or duodenal, that we would potentially create a problem with uh, end organ ischemia to the liver. So I, I wanted to try this first. The patient understands the potential limitations of this, and she recognizes that if we do see any evidence of persistent perfusion, that we're going to, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, bite the bullet and place a covered stent across the, uh, the uh, neck here. 